So the main definition between a class 4 and a class 3B laser is really given by the hazard that laser is posing to people within the, what is called the nominal hazard zone. The definitions straight from the book is, and they say only class 4 lasers are capable of producing hazardous diffuse reflections. So in a class 4 laser, the control not only of the primary beam, but also of all possible diffuse reflections from any surfaces, including the skin, has to be controlled. So the guidelines require at that point that you are working in a closed environment, no windows to the outside or other parts of the building, that all people inside that room wear appropriate laser safety goggles. And it goes even so far as to state that if the door is open, that means the hazard zone control is broken, the laser has to be shut down automatically. So it has to be an interlock between the door and the laser itself. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So the class four laser poses an additional risk to anyone who is basically potentially exposed to diffuse reflectance. The absolute power or the power density, I can change simply by focusing or defocusing any type of laser I want. So it's only based on the risk the laser is posing to the operator, the patients, and potentially other people who are venturing in the area where diffuse reflection and the primary beam can actually be. That's correct. So there are very strict guidelines related to the maximum permissible exposure, not only of the eye, but also on the skin. And because of low level laser therapy, we are always looking at the exposure of the skin as a primary target. We should look at those. Uh, exposure of the eye should not be intentional. Let's say at 970 nanometers, that's typically the longest currently used uh, laser in low level laser therapy. The maximum permissible exposure is about 800 milliwatt per square centimeter. Now, if we expose skin for 15 seconds only, we would deliver roughly 12 joules per square centimeter. In that wavelength range, the attenuation of the light by the tissue is so that only about 10% of the light would pass through one centimeter of tissue. That means 90% are going to be exposed. So in those 15 seconds, we will deposit more than 10 joules per cubic centimeter or gram of tissue. 10 joules per gram is sufficient to raise the temperature of that tissue by more than two degrees C without the advent of cooling, for example, through the blood. So the thermal load we are creating at those power densities is sufficiently high to actually cause not so much in selective photochemical effect, but really a photothermal effect predominantly. Particularly at 970 nanometers, where the predominant absorber is water, and depending on the tissue, we are comprised of between 55% and 75% of water. So we have a very direct heating of the water in the tissue. I have seen it that some people claim they can deliver up to 12 watt per centimeter square. If we go to those extreme situations, you are essentially risking a burn. That means you can actually raise the temperature of the tissue beyond 45 degrees in a matter of a few seconds. If I would be asked to put my hand in a laser beam of any wavelength that has 12 watt per centimeter square, I would not do that. And of course, if we heat the water over 45 degrees, then we're causing direct damage to the lipids and the proteins, which is detrimental overall for the application of lasers. And that's where the maximum permissible exposures are coming from. They are wavelengths dependent, but essentially at source, uh, if we exceed the maximum permissible exposure, we no longer uh, prevent damage to the tissue, we actually will heat the tissue, 
And that's why those guidelines were established. So again, there are requirements for which are very similar for class three and class four lasers, basically on administrative control of the laser, access to the laser. These are the key switches we have. The same applies also for training of the individuals to be used. Uh, medical surveillance is only suggested, but it's implicit in the application of low level laser therapy. Um, and both require the presence of a laser safety officer. The main difference becomes really in the fact that for a class 3B laser, you have to control only the primary beam. Uh, whereas for a class 4 laser, you have to control all possible diffuse reflections, even diffuse reflection coming from your skin that is still hazardous to your eyes. So there the need is essentially, yes, laser safety goggles for everybody in the room where the laser is operated, but also an essentially sealing and preventing from unauthorized access to that room while the laser is active, as well as preventing any leakage of direct laser light or diffuse laser light from that room. Essentially, you can't have windows or similar uh, uh, accesses to the room available at that point. So in low-level laser therapy, we are looking at activating particular cellular pathways. If those pathways are originating in the mitochondria via absorption in the cytochromes or the lipid, for example, where we know that those subcellular structures with their associated pathways can stimulate growth, reorganization of the tissue itself. Having excessive heat generated at the same time, particularly at an ubiquitous absorber like water, is probably taking away from those effects in a significant manner. A, the heat will directly destroy lipids and proteins, will inactivate them, but also secondarily it will mask a lot of the pathways, activities we are trying to stimulate. That was shown really then going towards an inhibitory function of heat or too much heat overall. And essentially it's coming back to the same point. This is why we have maximum permissible exposures to the skin. They have been established that beyond those levels we have uncontrolled heating of the skin and the probability to cause damage. Thank you.